So good evening, everybody. Um, I'll start over. Um, so thank you to Professor uh, Professor Sarah Seeger, who is an astrophysicist and professor of physics, professor of planetary science, and professor of astronautics and aeronautics at MIT, where she holds the class of 1941 professor chair. She has been a pioneer in the vast and unknown world of exoplanets and planets that orbit stars other than our sun. She's been a uh, she was the director, deputy science director of the MIT-led NASA Explorer class mission test and was PI of the JPL MIT CubeSat Asteria and was a lead of the Starshade Rendezvous mission. Most recently, she has directed a mission concept study to find life's lines of life or life itself in the Venus atmosphere and as a PI of a small mission to Venus targeted for launch in 2023, among other accolades. Her research is earned her a MacArthur Genius Grant, membership in the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and <clears throat> one of Canada's highest civilian honors, an appointment as an officer of the Order of Canada. Professor Seeger is also author of The Smallest Lights in the Universe, a memoir. Let's please welcome her and we look forward to the talk. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. And on Zoom. So in the last year of the last century, something amazing happened. We Earthlings discovered our first transiting exoplanet. Excuse me for one second. How many people here know what a transiting planet is already? Almost everyone. So we don't spatially resolve any stars like that other than our sun, but we can measure their brightness as a function of time. And so what we see is what that cartoon on the bottom is showing you the brightness of a star measured as a function of time. And if we're so lucky that a planet goes in front of the star, we'll see a tiny drop in brightness related to the planet to star area ratio. <coughs> yeah. My share is not showing up. Okay. Okay, how's that? Oh, perfect. Thank you. All right. So these transient planets are great because we can measure the size. If we know the size of the star, we get the area ratio, we'll get the size of the planet. And we can also, by a different planet finding technique, measure the mass. And with the mass and size, we get density of the planet. And to just kind of capture how far we've come since we discovered our first set of exoplanets, I just wanted to walk you through like this diagram. We call this a mass radius diagram. So every transiting planet can get plopped on this diagram if it has a mass and a size measured. What these curves are here, they are, okay, first of all, the axes are mass and Earth masses, and this goes over quite a large scale. It's on a log-log scale, and this is radius and Earth radii. So one Earth radius is here, and it goes 10, 20, 30, et cetera. These triangles are solar system planets, Venus and Earth. Earth, we conveniently... In astronomy, we just like to make everything a nice, easy, easy number. So it's one, or there's one Earth radius. And we scale everything accordingly. Uranus and Neptune, Jupiter, and Saturn. These are curves of constant composition for illustration. So imagine for a moment a planet made of pure iron. That doesn't exist in nature as far as we know, but just for argument's sake. You can see here that if you imagine a planet made of iron and you add mass to it, it gets larger, right? And initially, it should scale as r cubed as you add mass. But eventually, that law goes away, actually, and this curve flattens out. And if there were planets at 1,000 Earth masses, look at that. It would literally just flatten out. Because as you imagine a planet getting more and more massive, the outside, sure, is growing. But the inside gets so compressed that electrons pop off. I like to call it pressure ionized. And now the nuclei can squeeze closer together. So the outside is getting larger. The inside is getting compressed more and more. This um, is iron. These yellow ones would be rocky, like Earth-like material. Um, gr pure green is a pure water planet. We don't have that either, but it's just supposed to help guide your eye. So let's see where we're at here. In the year 1999, we had our first transiting exoplanet. There it is. Um, these curves here, they're not as relevant, but it's for cold hydrogen helium planets. I just wanted you to enjoy um, how many planets got discovered over the years. Someone was telling the story about me um, at dinner after reading this autobiographical chapter that when I was looking for a faculty job in the early 2000s, we just had this one or two lonely transiting planets. And the circles are planets we've discovered atmospheres around through the transit method. And I'll come back to that a bit later. 
but that was my whole thing. And people were like, well, we'll never have very many transiting planets because they just thought it was so hard to find. And sure, they are hard. But over the years, we just got so many planets. Look, that's the year 2008. You can just sort of look at how many transiting planets there are. And there's way more than that are on here because we don't, not all of them have a massive size. And please do interrupt with questions. We'll have lots of time at the end, but if there's a clarifying one I can help with, I would be happy to. Let's talk about some things we see. Whoa, look at all these. These are the giant planets. Here's Jupiter. And what's phenomenal is that there's some planets that are the same size as Jupiter, that they span more than a decade in mass. And that's because of what I was telling you, electron degeneracy pressure, where for the more massive objects, the inside is different from normal matter because it's such high pressure. The electrons are popped off and the nuclei can squeeze closer together. There are some planets that are Jupiter mass, but they're bigger than Jupiter, way bigger. These we can't fully explain. They must have some extra energy in their core that's keeping them puffed out. So as planets are born big and hot, they contract and cool as they age. And really, there's really more questions than answers at this point. We can see down here along this line where Earth and Venus are, it's kind of surprising, but there seem to be planets like clustered along this line. And these planets, for more detailed models than what you're seeing here, because they fall along the line of these rocky planets, they are rocky worlds, almost certainly, made mostly of rock-iron combination. And then we have all these things in the middle that are perplexing. We don't fully understand how our own Uranus and Neptune formed, but they're also orbit really far out where there's not a lot of material and things are very slow. But many of these are close to the star and there are planets smaller than Neptune. We call them not very imaginatively mini Neptunes. They're two to three times the size of Earth and they are literally appear to be the most common planet type of planet in our galaxy. We have no solar system counterpart and we don't fully know what they're made of. We want to imagine that some of these, you see they're falling on this so-called water area, that some of them might be water worlds, scaled up versions of Jupiter's icy moons, perhaps more than 50% water by mass. So we have all these planets, we don't really totally know what to do with all of them. Um, there's no planets up here in the top left corner. I mean, there are these gray ones, but the gray ones have big error bars and they may not really uh, survive in that spot when they get better uncertainties when the uncertainties are reduced. But if a planet's too big for its mass, it won't be gravitationally bound, and so it can't exist. I was always hoping we'd find some planets here, super massive, 100 times, 1,000 times Earth mass, but small. But apparently there's just not enough rocky material for that to happen. And we do think that once planets, once rocky material, rocky planets get to be about 10 Earth masses, they start accreting gravitationally being sort of powerful, like a cosmic vacuum cleaner and just starting to accrete all the material around them. And you do kind of see that here, right? Like at some point, the planet must just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the other, oh, that was my introduction, just to, you know, tell you where we're at. We have lots of planets, all different kinds. Yes. What uh, telescopes were used primarily? Well, they come in about mostly three categories. There are large, they're um, essentially cameras on the ground, like small telescopes or just wide cameras with like lens, wide field lenses. And those can find these giant planets. The giant planets make a drop in brightness about 1%. And so they're able to detect giant planets with short period orbits because our day night cycle and clouds and everything ruins that. Many of these were found by the Kepler Space Telescope. Kepler. Actually, no, that's not true. Kepler didn't find too many of these. Um, a bunch of them are found by TESS, and some of them are just found from radial velocity with um, phot phot photometry follow-up. Yeah. Well, Hubble doesn't find planets. It really studies them. These, I'm going to talk about that. I'll mention that in a moment when I get to talking a bit more about how we find planets. Um, yeah, the one other great thing about these exoplanets is when they go in front of the star, as seen from the telescope, these transiting planets, we actually can study their planet atmospheres. And I'm going to come back to that a bit later. I'm going to go a bit out of order. Um, right. So the problem when we want to think about finding signs of life beyond Earth is just really that our Earth is so tiny, and it's right next to a big, bright, massive star. So the problem we have here is 
So it's really weird because you're seeing this. Um, yeah. You, you, uh, yeah, I'm not really yeah. sure why that's here because I really wasn't sharing my entire desktop. So, you know, if you want to think about an Earth kind of out in outer space, one that's within 30, 100 light years or so, it's not really like the faintest thing ever, not fainter than the faintest galaxies ever observed by Hubble. The problem is an Earth would be right next to a big, bright, massive star. And all the techniques we use, we either have to get rid of the starlight or work in conjunction with the planet and star. So I just put some numbers there for you. I always like to ask the audience, like, if you were going to take a sabbatical and work on exoplanets and you wanted to find another Earth, which method would you use? Would you use one that involves planet size or area? In that case, our Earth is 100 times smaller than our sun or 10,000 times in area. That's pretty hard. I don't know how many of you and your work goes out to four decimal places. Maybe for you, your special audience. <laughs> but would you want to work on a technique that involves planet mass? You want to find the planet by its mass effect on its star. Well, our Earth is 300,000 times less massive. Maybe you're one of those people who's like an overachiever and you want to work on discovering the earth in reflected light. Well, our earth compared to our sun and reflect our earth in reflected light compared to the sun's just, you know, shining bright at visible wavelengths, our earth is 10 billion times fainter. So if you wanted to pick the first one, that's kind of how we're doing it right now. And those are the transiting exoplanets where we're looking for a drop in brightness from a planet that goes in front of the star as seen from our telescope. So again, we don't see the top thing, that's just artist conception, but we do see the bottom one. And I'm going to tell you now how we've been able to find thousands and thousands of planets by this technique. Right now, the field is dominated by the TESS mission. I know at least one person here worked on TESS. It's called um, MIT-led NASA mission. It's called the Transiting Exoplanet uh, Survey Satellite, launched April 18th, 2018 on a Falcon 9 rocket. This wasn't a used one, though. It was like new. But our rocket did land safely, and it came back to Cape Canaveral, and it was all like black, like sooty from its journey. Um, yeah, so TESS is a um, telescope. Actually, here's a picture of TESS in the clean room at Northrop Grumman Corporation while it was still being worked on. It has solar panels. It's got an um, antenna to communicate with Earth, to downlink data, and to receive commands. You can see it's not that big. It's like the size of two giant washing machines stacked on top to each other. It's got solar panels. Those are the only thing that folded and deployed. And here, um, there's like this giant baffle kind of sun shield. And down inside here, that's all like the heart and brains of the operation where there's like a data storage unit. There's the batteries and everything else, computers and everything in there. But what's of interest to us are these four blobs which are actually inside, um, by the way, these covers came off before launch, but there's four, um, okay, this is the wrong word for you, but from my non-optics viewpoint, glorified telephoto lenses in here. There's four identical cameras essentially. And here, oh, let me talk about this before I get to that. Yeah, this is a, a schematic just showing you the, um, you know, like a annotated version. It's kind of hard for you to see that. It's showing you what's inside, propulsion tank, thrusters, the overall structure. There's a lot going on. But inside here, these giant um, cameras, here's like we put the smallest guy with the lens assembly just so it looks really big. <laughs> but what essentially it is, it's like um, an F1.4. It's a 10 centimeter diameter. It's got seven different elements and it's like a custom made lens. It was actually um, designed and built here, at Link built at Lincoln Labs, actually. So there are at least one or two people in the audience who've worked on this. And also the CCD detectors were also fabricated at Lincoln Lab. Electronics were made at MIT. And this is just sort of, this is not um, a very good picture of it though. Here's a better picture. This is 10 centimeters in diameter. And what you're seeing here is a giant baffle. It's ribbed to block out light from the moon and from some bright objects in the sky and just scattered light from Earth's limb. And it's like this because you want to imagine a ray going in. You don't want it to bounce into your lens. You know, you want it to be able to, in most cases, bounce back right out. It looks blue. It's actually, um, the whole camera was designed to be red sensitive. So it works from 600 to 1,000 nanometers in broadband so that it's um, sensitive to small red stars, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, these are really wide. Um, oh, by the way, the detector is like a 16 megabyte um, detector, pixel camera. Um, these are really big, these cameras have a very big field of view. Oh, here's, this is going to show you each 
camera actually is 24 by 24 square degrees. And this is huge because you know what? Transiting planets are rare. The planet transits aligned just so, so the planet goes in front of the telescope as seen from our viewpoint. But in fact, it's, it's rare. Most planets orbit differently. If they're orbiting in the plane of the sky, you will um, not see that planet transit. The cameras are all bolted to a platform in a way that they map out this giant strip of a sky we call a sector. But I just want you to like think about that for a second, just how big that is. 96 degrees by 24 degrees for these whole things. And there's literally um, millions of stars landing on those detectors. Yes. Question? I was trying to figure out, yeah. Well, um, when you go like this, supposedly it's about, I think, 10 degrees or something. So this animation is just showing you that TESS stares at one of these sectors for about a month. And it tiles one hemisphere in a year. And then the next year, it tiles the other hemisphere. So our first hemisphere was the Southern Hemisphere. Then we went to the Northern Hemisphere. And the prime mission was two years, but it's been operational since essentially the summer of 2018. You can see that the poles overlap, right? Because we're trying to project a rectangle on a sphere. If your star fell in that gap, your favorite star, you'd just be out of luck. It won't be hitting any hardware. But um, as the years go by, it cycles through. That might help answer your question. One camera literally um, covers the entire constellation of Orion, if you're familiar with that on the night sky. Orion's pretty big, actually. And what this is showing you is that each camera has four CCDs making up the camera. So there's actually also some, um, let's just call it bad real estate in between these detectors. I mean, there's all sorts of tools online. If you have a NASA mission, they make it you know, as friendly as can be. So you can go into a website and if you know the name of your star or the coordinates, type it in and it'll tell you which sectors it has or will be observed. Here's like a tiny fraction like essentially like it says here, three quarters of one CCD on one camera. Just you can see like the wealth of stars. Yeah, there's definitely some issues of, of saturation, but on the whole, and this doesn't really do it justice. If you were to look, it looks very pixelated. Um, but I wanted to walk you through a bit about what we do with all this. We, um, I mean, computers do most of the work, but the star will register on the detector. And our goal, again, we're trying to get this brightness time series so this, um, some of the stars, they're not like nice spheres, but they're weird shapes because there's a lot of distortion at the edge of this very, very wild, wide field of view cameras. But essentially the computer will figure out some kind of shape to put around the star, um, you know, sort of separating it out where the pixels are lit up by the star and where they're not. And literally we'll do that for every single frame. And the computer will also try to identify that star based on a star catalog. We can't downlink all our data. So those who work on space are familiar with it. We've like major bottleneck. So we can only download, we download quite a lot of data though. It seems like a lot, like a couple hundred gigabytes um, every sector basically of compressed data. I don't know if that seems like a lot to you, <laughs> probably not like if you watch movies on your phone, but we have a real um, block in doing that. So we can't downlink like the full frame images. People spent many, many years figuring out exactly which stars are of the most interest. And those stars get priority. In our prime mission, for example, every sector, we could only get 20,000 stars where although the camera is exposing like every six seconds or something, we have to bin the data on board into like two minute chunks. And we want really short exposures because cosmic ray hits can destroy an image so we can throw those out on board. And so the data is, um, we call them postage stamps. Like you'll just get that kind of postage stamp around your star of interest. But we do also have full frame images that are been to 30 minutes. In fact, people found a way to do better now at 10 minutes. I mean, honestly, wouldn't you like, like all the data from your camera? But we just couldn't, we can't get all the data, everything down. So it has to be binned on board. And a lot of work, you know, goes into this. In fact, if you're an astronomer, you can propose for your favorite objects to get in a special category. There's some that even get 20 second binning. And you put in like a director's discretion proposal and the director will say yes or no. And then, you know, while your target is visible, you can get a special cadence. So, um, okay, I think I'm gonna skip that. All right, so I just want to like review what happens. So the computer measures the brightness of each star for each image frame. 
and computers construct this time series of brightness for each star. And the computer actually does a lot of work. They um, search for a drop in brightness. I'm not sure why this my text didn't come out here. But um, at the end of the day, after the computer does all this work, it finds the star, it creates the time series, it detrends the data, so it takes out a lot of artifacts automatically. It uh, face folds the data, searches for this pattern. And at the end of the day, out of those 20,000 stars, or even millions of stars, if it's looking at the full frame image, it spits out like a couple hundred. And then it literally goes to a team of human vetters. We have like an internal crowdsourcing kind of forum where people vote for it. And if um, anyone you know, votes like yes, then it goes to a group vetting session where we have a lot of auxiliary data and we weigh in whether or not it, the object, the light curve or that transit deserves to be, let's say, um, uh, prioritized. Like, yay, it gets a thumbs up and then it goes out to the community to get followed up. So I did want to, um, okay, I had some notes here. I had like a summary slide with everything that I just said. So it can monitor millions of stars and fields of one month duration. And we go from millions down to maybe a few hundred, which about a hundred of those kind of pass inspection and they get labeled a test object of interest, which is essentially a planet candidate. So we're gonna take like a little break from me um, blabbing on with a couple more slides. And then we're gonna do like a group activity of finding planets in the data. So this data comes from pretty early in the mission. And what you're seeing on the top row is um, relative flux. That's the brightness series of the stars a function of time. All of this, by the way, is Poisson noise. Do you, all, do you all know what that is? Yeah, it's a very unusual audience. Most people don't, but it's just noise from the star mostly. But any other weird things, um, like this is time in days. It's in a weird astronomy jargon, um, very centric Julian date. This is days, so this is about one month. And here, when the telescope is down linking data, it's not um, taking data. Early on the mission, we had some problems with pointing, so you see a little weirdness here. Well, the computer is finding the transits. It thinks it found these two transits. And they're very compressed, so it's not that beautiful kind of shape because it's all compressed together in this time, this, uh, time scale. But the computer phase folds the data, so it's gonna take these transits and bin them together for a stronger signal. And what we're gonna look at together is the bottom panel, which is showing you, excuse me, the black points are data. So this is phase now, the time is in hours, but it's called phase because there's more than one transit together. And I put, and the um, blue are bin data and the red is a, a best fit model to the data. So I put some notes of what we're looking for, okay? We're gonna look for a box shape because when a planet goes in front of a star, it crosses the limb fairly quickly. And so the light drops pretty fast. We're looking for a flat bottom light curve because when the planet's in front of the star, it's kind of moving along and nothing really changes. The star brightness is kind of constant. And we're looking for a small drop in brightness, which we might not be able to see because the axis isn't really explained well by me or designed well to do that. So the one major uh, contaminating thing we have are called eclipsing binary. So instead of a planet going in front of a star, it's two stars going in front of each other. And this cartoon is showing you what's happening that when one star goes in front of another, you get a big drop in brightness. Now, is this box shape? No, it is not. Because see, the big star, it's taking out a slightly different geometry as it's moving along, because it's so big. So it's very V-shaped. The other thing is that, interestingly, when you have the planet goes in front of the star, you get a big drop in brightness. When the planet goes behind the star, you get a tiny drop in brightness, because both stars are luminous. And when one goes behind the star, you're now missing light from, from one of the stars. They're kind of eclipsing each other in that sense. So you get a small drop in brightness. So what you end up with is a different, you know, all the odd transits would be the same and all the even transits would be the same. So this weird pattern you won't see for a planet because it doesn't, planet does not have its own brightness. It's not bright enough to usually cause this effect. Okay, let's get started. So let's look at the bottom one, which is the face folded data, time and brightness. We're looking for a planet transit. We're looking for a box shape. Anyone want to vote for a box shape here? <laughs> Small drop in brightness. Hard to tell from this plot, but yeah, it's a pretty big drop. Flat bottom light curve. Okay, I gave you a warm up. This was the warm up one. <laughs> and if you look at the top, what do you notice? Like the computer flagged what it found as the transits. And look, all different, right? Alternating, alternating. So that's a, really a giveaway that this is an eclipsing binary. 
And if you look at the phase folded data, it didn't really phase fold very well, did it? Because you're seeing two distinctive things. So yeah, it's two. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so what are we looking for here? We're looking for a box shape. Yep. Uh, flat bottom light curve. Yeah. Don't overthink it, okay? Because this is a quick exercise. <laughs> um, by the way, it's not, it's kind of a bit round, and that's because of this effect we call limb darkening on the sun. Our sun is not perfect, our stars are not perfectly the same across because they have some cooler outer layers and some hotter inner layers. <laughs> Small drop in brightness, we can't tell from here. This actually is a planet, and this was a known planet found by, to your point, a ground-based telescope that can find big you know, planets that are easy to find. And with tests being in space, above the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere, it, it's really clear. This is super clear. It's, it's a wow, easy one. Okay, next. Okay, so let's look at the bottom plot. We are looking for a box shape. Remember, we're looking at the blue points because that's the um, bin data from the real data. Small drop in star brightness. Flat bottom light curve. I mean, you might be looking at this and saying, what is wrong with this fit? This red line, the best fit model? Because <laughs> I feel like even a child could draw a line better through here. Yeah, sinusoidal, um, sinus, look sinusoidal, yeah. And this red one, by the way, it's not like just a random fit to the data. Obviously, it's a it has to be constrained by the transit geometry. So it's asked the computer's asking itself to fit something that has the transit geometry. But look at this top here. Wow, this is pretty crazy. The star is going bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim. And the computer seemed to think there was a transit, not the Satu pattern itself, but some little drop here. But this is a variable star. It's actually a pulsating star. It's getting bigger and smaller on the time scale, like a few days. And when it's bigger, it looks brighter. So, wow, that's amazing. So this is not a planet. This is a variable star. Okay, you're, you guys are, I know you're a very educated audience, so. And you're used to math and computers and equations and stuff. Okay, let's move on to a few harder examples. So the top here, this is the data. It's, you know, not ideal. It's a bit messy. The computer thinks it's found um, a transit and it's been the data down here, relative flux and phase in hours. So we're looking for a planet transit, a box shape. Okay. Small drop in star brightness, flat bottom light curve. So usually if you were gonna train to be a vetter, like to do this crowdsourcing activity for the project, it would be like a couple months probably. So it wouldn't be like a minute or two. And then, you know, you'd sit in some sessions and get training and we have some videos and there's a lot of auxiliary info that helps you sort through everything. In fact, some of the programs, there's two separate pipelines. They'll literally print out a hundred page report. Yeah, on their own. And they can, you can like look at the raw data before it's detrended and such. Well, this one, look at this. So it is a tiny drop in brightness. And we're looking at the blue points here against the red model. But what happens here on the right? I mean, there's a little rise here, but with the planet transit, that can't happen. Remember, we're defining the planet as something that's not very bright. It's not self-luminous or anything. So there's a drop in brightness, but there's an equal rise. That's not good. It's probably noise in that case. But I mean, if you're here working on this exercise, you wouldn't want to be the one to not pass an object through when it ends up being a great planet. I mean, imagine the aliens out there looking back at our sun as a star and just saying, nah, that one's just, nah, that's not, <laughs> not enough. Okay, this one probably wouldn't make it through. Okay, this one I think is the last one. So let's look at the bottom. We're looking for a box shape. Yep, small drop in brightness, flat bottom light curve, check, check, check. And look at the top here. The computer thinks it's seen a transit literally like every one of these points, which our eye can't see. So it's, an, it's good, right? Like that's the point I want you to walk away with is, the computer is searching at every possible period and every phase of where that transit could occur. And it's binning that data together, phase folding the data to get a stronger signal. So if this indeed is a planet, the computer was able to find something that we could never see by eye. That's pretty amazing. What's even more amazing is look, if this is a planet, how, you know, it's transiting once in orbit. So its orbit must be incredibly short, like half a day actually. And it turns out, yes, this is actually a planet. This is one of the first planets from the test mission, it just has a catalog name, LHS 3844. It's about twice Earth's mass, 1.3 times Earth's size. It's about 50 light years away. And it's year indeed, the time it takes to go around its star is only 11 hours. 
So there's a lot of planets out there, and I just wanted to give you a flavor of the main way that we find planets today. And because this is a NASA mission, by the way, a lot of levels of data products are put out in an archive available to anyone who knows how to use them. So you could just use the very lightly calibrated data. We still call that the raw data, but there's more sophisticated products as well, all the way down to those light curves I showed you. So it's really there for the public. And if you know anyone who would wanna do this, you can also do this very crowdsourced thing like we just did together, Planet Hunters tests, and the data is crowdsourced out. This isn't what I showed you, but just for the general public, it's people get on this data so fast that usually there's no planets, you know, there's nothing to do because people go through it so quickly, but they send snippets of the data out to like 30 of the same 30 people. will see the same slice, you know, and you're trained on clicking on what you think is a transit. They do put a lot of fake transits in though, because they have to, um, you know, make sure that it's working. So that was the first part of exoplanets and how we find them. And now I'm going to move on a bit to atmospheres. So you're a sophisticated audience. You know what a spectrum is. Here's our solar spectrum, not our solar spectrum. Um, it's amazingly beautiful, right? It's the continuous white light of our sun split up into colors. I always like to just review this, even if you've seen this before, know what this is. But it's amazing that you see all these lines. Most of these are atoms in our sun's photosphere, actually. And you, know, you see some really strong lines. It's very wide. You see some very narrow lines. We know 99% of our solar spectrum, but there's still part of it that's elusive. But for exoplanets, we want to study their atmospheres. You know, to the transit method, an Earth and a Venus would look the same, actually. And Earth and Venus are about the same size and mass. But as far as we know, one planet Earth has life, and the other one, at least until now, at least the surface of the planet is completely inhospitable to life. And eventually we want to find gases like oxygen or methane or nitrous oxide, gases that might be produced by life. So we need to study atmospheres of exoplanets. And how we do that, we actually really do that actually. Let me just go ahead for a second here. Okay, so I'm gonna to explain to you how we study exoplanet atmospheres. And this is another one of the key takeaways for you. You can see at the bottom here, this little cartoon with a fake planet and a fake star behind it. And when a planet goes in front of the star, the artist's conception here, the artist wants you to see this atmosphere that's glowing. Some of the starlight shines through the atmosphere. It's showing you the atmosphere lit up. But what I want you to think about is that transit, that drop in brightness caused by the area of the planet compared to the area of the star. And I want you to think about a wavelength where the atmosphere is completely transparent. Your drop in brightness would be related to the area of this disk, this brown dark disk, right, compared to the area of the whole star. But if the now we want to think of a different wavelength where the, the atmosphere is opaque, the atmosphere is strongly absorbing. Now the planet looks a tiny bit bigger because now the area is not just the area of this disk, but it's the disk plus the area of the annulus. And that's tiny, actually. And so we measure literally the transit at different wavelengths. And we're looking to see if the planet looks a tiny bit bigger at some wavelengths compared to others. So I'm not sure if all of you understood that fully, but that's the heart of like how we study exoplanet atmospheres. We're looking for the planet where it looks a little bit bigger at wavelengths where the atmosphere is strongly absorbing. And this is the Webb Telescope's first exoplanet atmosphere. And they've conveniently labeled it amount of light blocked in parts per million. And the wavelength is in microns. This is going from 0 0.75 to 1.75 to 2.75. And the white points are data and the blue is a model. And what you're supposed to do is agree with me that these white points are different from a straight line. If you do that, believe that, you believe that a little more light or the planet looks a little bit bigger at some wavelengths compared to others. And these wavelengths actually correspond to where water vapor is strongly absorbing. And so the Webb telescope, without really trying, basically just saw water vapor in a hot giant planet atmosphere. Yes. So each point, am I understanding it correctly that each point comes from a variety of different phase folded transits, like in what you were showing before? Yes. However, in this particular case, they're not phase folded. It's just one single transit because the data is so good. It's really hard to get that. So it's really good that you got that right away. It's like you have to think of lots of transits, but one transit at every wavelength. So this will be phase folded. Will be phase folded as more time passes, yeah. 
And not only is this just the whole transit, but we're just now saying how deep is the transit? You know, we'd fit a curve and that depth of transit ends up being this point with the air bar. I have a better one. So while you're asking questions, I just want to go to a better version, a newer planet. Yes. Um, well, I mean, there's enough signal. No, no I'm asking about the error button. Yeah. Um, do you want to know where they come from or you don't see them? No. Yeah, they actually are on my screen, but why don't we just, they're definitely there. Let's just go to this, This. let's go to this one because I think you can see these, yeah. Yeah, the, it's on my screen, but didn't show up there. So the second planet, the web, and by the way, I'm just assuming everyone knows what the Webb Space Telescope is. Okay, I just made that assumption. <laughs> um, the Webb is amazing, honestly. It's so breathtaking. It was definitely worth waiting for. But how many people woke up to watch the launch on Christmas morning? Yeah. It was a great launch. So this is showing you a, the first one I showed you was just almost like a test case. The Webb just looked at it. It wasn't a program. The second one is like a planned observation from a team that competed to get telescope time. This is a planet, it's WASP-39b, it's a giant planet, it's really hot, its atmosphere is 1,000 Kelvin. And this again is showing you the depth, the drop in brightness as a function of wavelength. And here you see a giant feature, right? It's looking at the white points with the error bars, it's unequivocal that there is a huge bump here. The planet looks bigger. And you can read off this graph, you know, how much bigger, it's still very tiny actually. Let's see if we just call this 2.1 and up here, let's call it 2.25. That is 0.15. It's, pardon? 5%. Um, so this is actually carbon dioxide. At the bottom, they're showing you the absorption cross-section of different molecules. And this is wavelength in microns now, 3 to 5.5. And yeah, you see this like big bump here. It corresponds to carbon dioxide. By the way, supposedly the mode they used to make this observation, it also included shorter wavelengths, but those ended up saturating. And we're still like, when we do ground-based observations, if any of you, um, I don't know if anyone's an astro, I'm not an astrophotographer, but I was just trying to see, maybe someone is. Well, when I've observed, I'm not generally an observer, but what you'll do is to figure out the right exposure is you'll just expose and you'll keep exposing like for longer and longer until it saturates. And then you kind of know where you're at. You can't do that with the web. You can't be there kind of commanding it from the ground and like telling it, do this, do that. Everything's planned in advance based on um, like tools that the telescope, the people who run the telescope have made basically. So you're kind of guessing. But in this case, uh, they have to revise those choices now because it ends up saturating at the shorter wavelengths. So pretty excited about this telescope. This is all the data that's been published on exoplanet atmospheres, but the takeaway is we can observe atmospheres. With Hubble, we've observed dozens and dozens of exoplanet atmospheres. With Webb, we're really just getting started. So what we're facing with now is I drew a little cartoon for you showing you the star and the atmosphere. And the way I try to think of the signal is it's like the area of the annulus of the atmosphere compared to the area of the whole star. And some of you probably can do this in your head in like a moment. Some of you might've memorized the formula. But the formula for that annulus, it's really just two times the radius of the planet times the height of this annulus over r squared, right? Because remember the how to get that formula, you do pi r squared of the outer circle minus pi r squared of the inner circle. And once you do that, a, you know, a bunch of things cancel. And then you say, well, the height of that layer squared is so tiny, so we throw that out. So I don't know if any of you remember this. It's, you know, just like high school geometry. But the question is, what is the height of this atmosphere? Well, we actually can estimate that. I just call it five times the scale height of the atmosphere, where the scale height is, it's kind of like, it is actually the E-folding factor for like how density and pressure drop off as function of altitude. So I think of this like as the people who hiked up Mount Everest, they run out of air because our atmosphere is getting less and less dense and they run out of oxygen, they run out of air. And I just put some formula here for anyone who cared. Well, the pressure drops off exponentially with altitude and we have just a scaling factor that you can work out if you um, wanted to do some you know, very basic physics, you could actually work this formula out. 
So for those planets I showed you, those are giant planets. They're hot. They have a really big temperature. They have a, this is Boltzmann constant, temperature, gravity, and mean molecular weight of the atmosphere. They're also made of hydrogen, puffy, very big. Let's think of like a rocky world of the kind that might support life. Is that going to be a thousand Kelvin? That's like 300 Kelvin. So we drop down by a factor of three in our scale height. So our atmosphere signal is going to be three times smaller. Is Earth's atmosphere made of hydrogen? No, it's um, nitrogen. And our mean, like our number for nitrogen would be 14 times two, which is, well, we don't have to do the times two because hydrogen is two. And on that same scale, nitrogen would be 14 times two. So we lose another factor of 14. So three times, let's call it 15 is 45. We're already down a factor of 45. It's hard. So our, that annulus, that area of that annulus um, is shrinking now because for a rocky world, it's colder and it is, um, you know, just think of it having like a heavier atmosphere that's like clean closer to that planet. The flip side of that, by the way, if there was a planet like Earth with a hydrogen rich atmosphere and your atmosphere is all puffed out and you could hike up Mount Everest, you wouldn't run out of air because your scale height would be like, um, you know, many times, that was 14 times, right? 14 times more favorable. So that's what we're facing. And so we're stuck right now. We can't study an Earth-Sun analog right now. It just is not in our favor. We have to have something better. We're, I'm hoping that there are some planets that are hydrogen rich that are Earth size, but it's hard to imagine that planet holding onto its hydrogen. So instead, the whole field is fixated on small planets transiting small stars. Because see in this picture here, it's a real image of our sun and a fake image of a small red dwarf star, the most common type of stars out there in our galaxy. And there's a fake Earth, and look how much better that is. You know, our, our Earth, our transit would be one part in 10,000, but for a planet going in front of a small star, it's one part in 100. And the atmosphere to star ratio, instead of being one part in a million, it's one part in 10,000. So that whole thing is fixated on these. Anyone heard of the TRAPPIST-1 system? It's this extremely popular, most favored planet star system. There are seven planets all shown here with these transits um, transiting. They have these, you know, beautiful light curves. There's seven of them. On the right, it's showing you our sun compared to the TRAPPIST-1 system. And look, Jupiter and that star TRAPPIST are quite similar in size. In fact, this star TRAPPIST-1, it's only a tenth the size of our sun. If it was any smaller and colder, it wouldn't be a star. It wouldn't be able to fuse hydrogen in its interior. So these amazing planets and we have the Webb telescope and we know how to study atmospheres and people are really excited about this field. So just for a little mental break, let's go on a brief virtual trip to a planet orbiting a red dwarf star. So they're actually, um, you know, these red dwarf stars, they give us so little energy that for the planet to be the right temperature for life, it has to be pretty close to the star. So in some cases, the star or the sun on that planet would be very big in the sky. Because the planet's so close to the star, tides over millions or tens of millions of years force the planet into the most favored energy state, which is the planet rotates one time for every time it orbits, just like our moon does. You know, our moon shows the same face Earth at all times. There'd be a planet like our moon. And what that means is that one side is always in day and another side is always in night. So if you got to visit this planet, what side would you go to where it's always day? <laughs> where it's always night. Oh, you go to the transition, huh? Where the sun is always setting. <laughs> All right. Um, I would probably go there too. Um, we want to see, do you guys know um, you're in the optical sciences? Do you know what the green flash is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could imagine if you could go there where the green flash was kind of, oh, not maybe permanent, but you know, kind of coming and going as this is around, yeah? That would be pretty awesome. Well, the year on the planet is really short because the planet is so close to the star by Kepler's third law, it's orbiting quite quickly actually. And some of these Trappist planets, their year is just a few days. But then I always say on second thought, this and even just the idea of visiting one of these planets would be a terrible idea because the stars give off flares. These red dwarf stars are very active. They're giving off flares and high energy particles. We wouldn't be able to um, always be on our phones because that high energy radiation would knock out the electronics. Um, I guess everyone's from around here. Well, you know, here we get the snow days and like the roads are shut down and you get to stay home. I always imagine there they'd have like a flare day. There's like a prediction, there's a flare coming, it's going to hit Earth. Just stay in your protected basements for the day. I think it's pretty scary. Has anyone here heard of the Carrington event? 
in um, the late, I think it was 1850s, I want to say, an astronomer Carrington was studying sunspots and he saw them brighten. And a day and a half later, our Earth literally became electrified. You could see northern lights supposedly down to the equator. And here in Massachusetts, supposedly, we could just go outside and maybe it would be hard, but we could read a book by them. So bright. And what happened was our sun gave off, it had a flare and had a coronal mass ejection. This is a satellite image of our sun. It's just at H alpha, a very narrow wavelength. So it looks all modeled, but this wasn't anything big, but it gave off a part of the sun and it came hurtling towards earth. Mm -hmm. And at the time people hadn't, Maxwell's equations weren't articulated. People didn't fully understand electricity and magnetism, but that part of the sun had an embedded magnetic field and it came and hit our earth's magnetic field and induced a current. And like no one died or anything, but the telegraph wires caught fire. People could run, operate their telegraph without batteries. It was a, it would be a pretty weird place. And people literally are worried that it's going to happen again sometime. And that if it does happen, um, this isn't obviously what my talk's about, but uh, it's our power grid is really in danger. And if you do like, um, you know, disaster movies, disaster stories, there's a book called Aurora. And it's actually about this, it kind of describes, but you know, all these disaster movies, they have to have one or two like miracles, like something that goes oddly wrong that shouldn't, but I won't spoil it for you, but I highly recommend this book. And it kind of walks through this event happening. It follows two characters. One's a prepper, any preppers in the room? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a prepper, you know, like storing stuff up, planning for a disaster, planning for maybe not the Carrington event, but something. Mm -hmm. And then it follows another person who is the opposite, actually. And it's kind of interesting. It follows these characters against the backdrop of like this complete disaster. So, you know, these, like I said, no one died during the Carrington event. And maybe it's not bad for life, like it lived on the far side or under the surface. I'm not sure. But it's causing a really big problem for us, actually. And although it sounds funny, it's terrible. Right now, we're all of the trap is. Um, many of the Trappist planets have been observed in transit already. And it's not public yet. People are still figuring this out. But the star, because it's so active, it's also variable. And its variability right now at the moment is preventing us from looking at the atmosphere. Because remember, the transit is changing with wavelength. But because of this variability, the star is looking different. And I know you're with a lot. Most of you are still with me. We want to bin those transits. We can't bin them because the star is different. Every time it transits, the star's looking a bit different because the star spots are coming and going and the star's rotating. And this variability, it changes as a function of wavelength. You know, think of our sunspots, but a lot of star spots where those spots themselves um, have their own variability with wavelength. Yes? Question. For that example, too, you showed there's like seven different stars, I think. Or seven seven planets, planets, yeah. So doesn't that also interrupt? Like, how do you detangle yeah. those from each other? You can if they're, they don't always transit at the same time, though. Um, they can, sometimes they transit at the same time, and that's really cool, but you can actually work that all out because we know the orbits of them all. Yeah. Yeah, so the variability of the star is giving us a bit of a problem right now that we're trying to sort through. But that's like the newest thing I can give you that's uh, a struggle. And we had hints of that already, actually, from Hubble Space Telescope data. So about these planets transiting small stars, I mean, it's great that we can observe their atmospheres. We know a lot about them. But you know, our first question is, do they have an atmosphere? Because the star is so active and has been even more active for long periods of time when it was all younger. If they do have atmospheres and we can find features, we'd like to know, is there water vapor? Because water vapor on a small rocky world is um, indicative of liquid water oceans. Water should be destroyed with hydrogen escaping to space and isn't. And if all that pans out, we'd like to search for, for signs of life, actually, by way of biosignature gases. So which gases would we search for? You know, here on our own Earth, we have oxygen, where oxygen fills our atmosphere to 20% by volume. But without life or without photosynthetic bacteria, we would have literally no oxygen. So if there's, um, yeah, so we really do, you know, if it's been nearly 100 years since this, an astronomer, James Jeans, first thought of this idea that we have oxygen, it's so reactive, without plants, we would have none, that we should be looking for oxygen on other planets. I was probably thinking, obviously, of planets in our own solar system. So yeah, I do, um, I'm gonna run out of time because I want to make sure we leave time for questions, but I'm wondering if anyone here had felt, heard of the Phosphine on Venus saga. I was actually a part of that team, and I wanted to give you like a brief update of this, actually. 
um, but I don't know if I'm gonna have time to do it justice. So I might just, okay. So um, my team, I've literally thought about biosignature gases maybe for 10 or 15 years. And my team actually, believe it or not, it's sort of like the squirrels in the fall, they're collecting nuts. You don't really know why you do something, you're just compelled to do it. And we literally enumerated every gas that every molecule that can be a gas form, like on planet, you know, habitable temperatures. And we went off on this giant kind of chemoinformatics project. We didn't need all to do all of that to find this interesting gas, but one of the first gases that popped out of our analysis was phosphine. Because on Earth, um, phosphorus, it wants to go with oxygen. We have, remember, remember we talked about how our Earth, we have very little hydrogen, it doesn't stick around. And phosphine, by the way, it's very hard. It's hard to make on Earth. It takes energy. It's not going to just be happening naturally. It's thermodynamically disfavored. Um, it's, um, yeah, definitely not. But on Earth, it's only associated with life. So we were pondering phos phosphine as a potential gas to look for in like the Trappist plants or elsewhere. And what's really interesting is that we found out that across the globe, another person was thinking about phosphine. And this is Professor Jane Greaves. So someone connected our two teams and she invited us to join her in her search for phosphine. She is pretty remarkable because she went out on a limb and purposely wanted to search for signs of life in the Venus atmosphere. And she dug through all the literature and also came across phosphine as on earth being only associated with life. And she found out that phosphine has a rotational transition. It's ground to first excited state at millimeter wavelengths where she is a radio astronomer. And here's two rate, here's, um, James, GCMT, James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii, and there's ALMA, a big um, array of telescopes in Chile, high in the dry desert. And what's weird about Venus is, not weird, but you know, it's so bright. Like if you're an amateur astronomer, you know how you see it in the night sky or the morning sky, it's so bright. It's almost too bright, really. These big facilities, they weren't made for really bright, spatially resolved objects, and they caused a lot of noise. So we did make an announcement two years ago and it was met with like a huge, um, almost backlash really. People were very upset. We um, went through this. We actually literally wrote a hundred pages of all the known chemistry, arguing that whatever you could think of that could make phosphine, be it meteors or lightning or volcanoes or surface minerals getting swept up. Although many of those can make phosphine, it was way, way smaller, even than the parts per billion amount that we reportedly detected. So we're met with a lot of controversy. And the main issue is the data analysis, actually. All the data is public from these large facilities. People jumped angrily on that data, rushed through it. And they basically, some teams did not recover the signal. You know, that's bad news. We need to do a lot of heavy detrending, you know? The more manipulation you have to do, the worse it is. And the signal's pretty small. It's like one part in 10,000 um, or a bit smaller, actually. And the problem with this data is there were like really large noise features and there's sort of a standard way to remove them um, in radio astronomy. You literally just fit a polynomial, no matter how many, how high an order you need, and you just remove it. And people, yeah, it sounds bad. Um, part of the talk I skipped, by the way, was what we did in the test data. I skipped that part because I thought it was going to, I was, you know, I thought it was going to run out of time. But in the test data as well, we we don't fit big polynomials there, but you'd be surprised at all the trends in data that we just remove. We don't ask ourselves, what is the exact physical cause? Like what was in the detector that made the response be that way? We don't do that, we just remove it. So some people um, analyzed the data and did not recover the signal. In some cases, people did recover the signal, particularly from the James Clerk Maxwell telescope data. But then there they would wanna say, it's not phosphine, it's a different gas. And the one other gas it could be is sulfur dioxide, which has like a higher order rotational transition, but we also, anyway, this kind of just goes back and forth. And mostly for this part of the story, I just wanted you to know that it's still going back and forth. It's not like obviously being amplified in the news media, but every single paper that comes out that has a reason why it's not phosphine or not in the data, Professor Jane Greaves and her data analysis team actually writes another paper explaining why it is there. <laughs> And I was actually giving a talk this morning, actually, to a Mars group. There's like a Mars mission. It's been orbiting in the high atmosphere of Mars for um, like a decade. And they were meeting in Boston. And they asked me, what did I think of methane on Venus, methane on Mars? If you've heard of methane on Mars, um, 15 years ago, the same thing. Someone used ground-based telescope, found signs of methane on Mars. The community pushed back and it's like, it can't be. This went on for a long time. Um, there are two orbiters. I think one saw it, one didn't. A rover has seen outbursts of methane in various places. 
And this group of like 100 people told me that most of them don't believe there's methane on Mars, actually, 15 years later, after like a lot of back and forth. Now, methane on Mars could be, if, the, if it's really there, by life, or it could be um, geological. There's a process that can make methane where hot water goes over cracked rocks. But still, this could take a long time to play out. So this is still ongoing. But what phosphine did was it actually, um, okay, before I get to what phosphine did for us, I just wanted to review why it's crazy. Well, due to a massive carbon dioxide greenhouse atmosphere, Venus's surface temperature means it's too hot for life of any kind. But just like here on Earth, if you hike up the mountains, it gets colder and colder, so too on Venus. And so since Carl Sagan half a century ago, people have speculated that there could be life in the clouds. So that's kind of where this whole thing is. And that if there's life that's confined to the clouds, it could be there creating gases and it could be it could be there. Our own earth has temporary, life gets temporarily swept up and stuck in our atmosphere. But even with that happy picture, it's still a terrible place for life. There's very little water available and the cloud particles, they're made of sulfuric acid, which is a very aggressive solvent. And it's very, you don't wanna spill that on your clothes or you know burn a hole through it. It destroys pretty much most biochemicals, uh, our life on earth will get destroyed. But what this phosphine did that's so amazing, um, it's remarkable actually, is it shone a new light on Venus. It has inspired NASA to send two missions to Venus that were been proposed over and over again for decades. The last time NASA went to Venus was about 40, four decades ago. The European Space Agency will go as well. And it did some other things. We started looking at, we meaning me in the community, looking back at old data. And it's not just the possibility of phosphine, there have been tentative discoveries from in-situ missions from the former Soviet Union and from NASA with tentative detections of ammonia, also a gas that doesn't belong, tiny amounts of oxygen, which don't belong, major depletions of sulfur dioxide and water vapor, and like this kind of host of chemical mysteries that have been shelved because people didn't know what to do with them. And all of this now is coming right back out at us, actually. And there's something even more amazing. Okay, it looks like I don't have this one slide I wanted. Um, let me just skip ahead to see if I have that slide. I don't, okay. There's something even more amazing. I'll just have to use words to tell it to you. And that is that the sulfuric acid that there's been a paradigm in planetary science that is sterile to any interesting chemistry, that is literally changing right now as we speak. One group um, inspired by my team, uh, they actually found that sulfuric acid, if you seed it with a small organic molecule, it develops into a rich organic chemistry. And this is pretty remarkable actually. But then they did some literature digging and found this is already very well known in the oil industry where they use concentrated sulfuric acid to convert crude oil to more refined products. And in the process of doing that, they get a whole bunch of organic molecules that they don't want. They call it red oil. It's like one person's trash is another person's treasure. And so weirdly, this was already known in that field. And we also got another group to uh, this is a group at Harvard, Daniel Duzovich, who's a postdoc in Jack Shostak's lab. They're trying to discover, um, they're trying to like create life in the lab, like literally cells from like nothing. And we got them to try a biological material, a special lipid, a fat, and they put it in sulfuric acid and it also self-assembled into a membrane, a spherical vesicle. So this lipid, that's like a biological material, not only survived, but could make what you could imagine as a cell wall. So I don't know here if we're on a wild goose chase or it's the best thing ever, but there's like this thing changing before our eyes. And I too have spent, I've started to do some chemistry experiments myself showing that some complicated molecules can survive in sulfuric acid. So where are we headed with this? I actually um, have been moving from exoplanets to work on Venus. And I've assembled a team and we studied what kind of missions could we send to Venus? How could we go there? And we have our first mission to Venus. We've teamed up with Rocket Lab, they're a small, uh, they actually specialize in small rockets in the commercial space. And we have a mission. Um, we have a target launch date of 2023 with a backup of 2025. This is like throwing a rocket Venus. It's like a small mission. It's um, going to send a cruise vehicle that's going to cruise, take a few months to get to Venus and drop off this probe. And the probe is about 20 kilograms. It's about 40 centimeters in diameter. And it's going to go through that atmosphere. It'll spend an hour traveling to the surface. We're only going to take data in the cloud layer is what we care about. And we're going to probe the cloud particles. We only have a few minutes in the clouds. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to search for fluorescence. You all know what fluorescence is, but this young man on the left, he's getting this special eye test on his cornea. And you can see that fluorescence there, right? 
um, you shine like an ultraviolet light and it excites electrons, which cascade back down. And we had part of our team work in the lab with organic molecules in sulfuric acid. This thing I told you about that they seeded the molecules and saw this rich organic chemistry. And they were testing out where should we put our ultraviolet um, wavelength laser and our detector. And you can see these points here are where different molecules getting different wavelengths of excitation um, actually gave off emission or fluorescence. We had to go up here. You might argue that this cluster looked a bit better, but we, um, uh, wavelength laser that was available, and that's the range of our detector. And what we're doing is we have a small instrument we call an autofluorescence nephilometer. It's really tiny, and it lays less, less than a kilogram. And so far, it flies commercially like on the outside of aircraft, but it's going to shine an ultraviolet laser through a window at these cloud particles looking for fluorescence. And if we find fluorescence, we'll know that there, we won't know if there's life, we won't know what the molecules are, but we'll be able to say that there is interesting chemistry inside the droplets, which will be enough to like move this field forward. And we'll also be measuring the backscattered polarized radiation, an experiment that's been done before on Venus, which will tell us something about the particle composition and shape. So if you want to, you can go to venuscloudlife.com and you can read about our study. You can download, if you wanted to, this 120 page document. We have sort of a series of missions that we're thinking about where would help us find signs of life on Venus. So just to finish off, this talk, um, I started talking about exoplanets. I talked about atmospheres and gases, and then I talked about Venus. But if people are like angry about phosphine on Venus, if methane on Mars after 15 years and orbiters and rovers are still not sure, what are we gonna do with exoplanets? You know, we can see their atmospheres, we can find gases, but you know, are you gonna believe like the next speaker that comes by and tries to argue that they found phosphine on an exoplanet? Well, yes, it's, that's a thought you can ponder on your, on your way home because it's going to be really tough. We know very little about exoplanets compared to what we know about Venus and Mars. So there's some ideas just to plant for the future. We have to have these seeds for a new paradigm. This is what to tell your, um, I'm just going to joke for a minute, like your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, right? But someday we need to do something better. And we have a couple of ideas. There's Breakthrough Starshot, a concept to send thousands of star chips with solar sails with a giant bank of lasers on the ground that would shine up to accelerate these sails to like a 20th of speed of light. And that they would, you know, just like the turtles in the spring or the little baby turkeys, you know, they don't all survive, but some would get there. I and mean, this is a hard problem, but to send it, send it by. Okay, and another problem, I'll see if this has the same giggle factor, but another concept people are putting out there is the solar gravitational lens telescope that we use our sun as a gravitational lens. And if we could send a telescope or a series of telescopes, again, they would have to be moving very quickly and be far from our sun, like 500 times the Earth's sun distance. But if you did this right, you could get a 10 kilometer spatial resolution on an Earth um, if you, you know, lined it up properly, knew where it was. So you know, long time ago, people laughed at exoplanets. This is really hard and has to wait future generations. But the search for signs of life, it's way more complicated than we initially expected it to be. So to summarize, we have exoplanet atmospheres. Your takeaway is transit transmission spectra, how the planet looks bigger as a function of wavelength. It's a maturing field and the Webb telescope is ushering in a new area, era, era. But it's the Earth twin is the wrong thing to think about. Because of the numbers involved, we have to go after the small planets transiting the small stars. This activity and variability on the star is creating a bit of a problem for us that we have to solve before we can really study their atmospheres. Um, this led me to talk about Venus undergoing this paradigm shift in the concept of the clouds of Venus and what chemistry they might be able to support. So the lessons learned is that we can study atmospheres. It's hard to be sure about life, but I'm convinced we will find some signs that will be enough to keep the search going. Thank you for your attention.